Hello, everyone. Happy Veterans Day. If you have served or know someone who served, I just want to give a shout out to you to say thank you for your service. Um, I realize there's a lot of compromising and sacrifice that goes with that. So I want to acknowledge that. Happy Veterans Day. Second, um, to kind of play off of what Tammy was talking about, I have started a few betrayed partners groups. And so it is fresh in my mind. Well, A, how chaotic the initial first several months or year or so of uncovering this major crisis within a, a relationship can be. And so for a lot of these people in the betrayed partners groups, I've been trying to provide some really basic logistical guidance on the first steps, kind of the first steps out the gate. It's really tough to organize your thoughts. It's really tough to kind of think logistically, what do I need? I've never done this before. You know, I, I equate it to my mom suddenly was a healthy person dancing up on a stage and the next minute she had stage four pancreatic cancer. And we never dealt with cancer before. We don't even know where you go. We don't even know where you begin to look to start researching where to go. And the pressure was, you know, immeasurable because it was a death sentence and you're just trying to find out as much information in the tiniest, shortest period of time with the greatest amount of stress and strain and hurt and fear all wrapped up in it. So I can imagine that's what betrayed partners probably feel like. I never meant to be an expert in this field. I don't even know where to begin. Um, luckily, if you are chiming into these videos, you are already beginning the first steps, obviously, right? You've somehow found us um, at sexandrelationshiphealing.com. Um, and so let's, let's keep talking about that. So again, today I'm gonna be talking about first steps kind of after unraveling what we call betrayed partners, which is often defined as someone who is a partner or married to someone who's been um, sex sexually acting out compulsively outside of the marriage, whether it's the, like the form of chronic affairs, so multiple affairs, um, sometimes transactional sex like prostitutes and other um, forms of that, chronic compulsive pornography, or just a lot of inappropriate pushing boundaries, um, emotional affairs, et cetera, with a, a lot of people along the way. Um, so these partners will be married to um, the sex addicts and something will bring it to their attention. Maybe they always had an inkling. Maybe they always thought something wasn't working. They've obviously had a lot of, not obviously, that's not the right word, but there's been maybe some indications of some marital relational issues, but they can't quite put their finger on it. Um, and then it, it blows up for some reason. And so these are kind of steps to take if you're in that zone, what you can do. So first and foremost, um, understand that this is trauma, that this is not much different physiologically. So your body will take this experience in no different than if you were held up at gunpoint or if you were given a terminal cancer diagnosis or a loved one was, or you got in a very serious car accident, your body doesn't take the time to differentiate between one life-threatening issue and the other. This is life-threatening. This is your livelihood. This is a person and a family that you thought was one situation. And suddenly now the person you're married to is no longer that person you thought that he or she was, and you are turned backwards and upside down and everything is threatened in that moment. Um, so understand that this is trauma and your body will be experiencing this as trauma. So there will be preoccupations, lots of flashbacks, lots of triggers from music or restaurants, et cetera, you'll find a hard time focusing on anything else. You will sleep too much. You won't sleep enough. You'll eat too much. You won't eat enough. You will feel heart palpitations. You will feel constant stress. Um, and it's important that you, one of the biggest, most resounding things that I want you to get from this is because you will be in a state of trauma, you have got to take the measures to 
self-care. Um, so come up with that. I know it's, again, it's hard to use your executive functioning in these states, but if there's little glimmers when you were able to calm down, maybe it's through deep breaths, maybe it's through seeing some friends, maybe it's through playing with your kids, um, church groups, support groups, et cetera, we've got to seek those out and make a commitment to engage them even when you don't want to, because sometimes you'll just want to shut, up, shut down, curl in a ball and not engage. So that's first things first. Um, proper referrals. I'm reminded with a lot of these betrayed partners is that um, there's so much going on. Um, yes, there is, you know, they have a husband or a wife who just deeply betrayed them. But sometimes, not always, there's other addictions going on. There's substance abuse issues. Um, sometimes there is a, like a firing. Um, so someone pushed a boundary at work because of their sex addiction and their compulsivity and problem, and they get fired. And so there's issues along those lines. There's needs for you know, legal referrals. Um, there's needing to educate yourself about legal issues, family law stuff. So those are important referrals. And then there's also the potential for needing medication for yourself, for your others. Um, lots of people have lots of opinions about psychotropic medication. My, my opinion varies widely as well, but sometimes, not always, psychotropic medication is used, needed for chronic mental health issues. Um, for your acting out partner or yourself, I, we don't know. A psychiatrist is a great person to seek out for that. But also sometimes psychotropic medication, like anti-anxiety, anti-depression medications, mood stabilizers are needed for the season of the crisis that can help you, you know, stay present long enough with, with your children or your job or making really important family life decisions that you need to have your executive functioning turned on for, that you need to sleep for, et cetera. And so sometimes a referral to a psychiatrist for the season of the crisis might be helpful. Um, support systems. I, a couple um, webinars ago, I talked about the varied levels of treatment options that you have, right? Um, inpatient, outpatient, um, seeing a therapist one-on-one, -on -one, going to support groups, going to 12-step meetings. I explain it all. I would encourage you to check that out. But there are a plethora of options of now that the crops hit the fan, what are my options to get help? One of the things, the other pieces that I want you to hear is that it needs to be specialty help. Um, another common theme when you hear these betrayed partners groups that I remember is we had these marital issues or I thought they were marital issues. So we would go to a therapist and there'd be this huge focus on communication and why are you so angry and um, why don't you have sex with him anymore or golly, you have gained a little bit of weight after the three kids, you know, stuff that is completely irrelevant and even more shaming and traumatizing when you do not have a specialist who knows how to ask the right questions and assess the situation. And, and quite honestly, when you work in this field, there's like a je ne sais quoi where there's just kind of these little red flags that lead you to kind of want to go down paths that other non-specially trained therapists might not know that that's kind of like, that doesn't make sense. Wait, what? This, this has happened multiple times. I need to ask more questions about what's going on here. Um, so please, when you seek out your support group, you've got to make sure that there's a, a specialist. And for instance, if your betrayed partner also has alcoholism or drug issues um, or gambling or pornography or, you know, and sexually acts out, there's got to be an expectation that all are being dealt with. Um, so make sure that that's happening as well. Staggered disclosures. This is extremely traumatizing. Um, what happens, and, and I want to give everybody grace here, but what happens is you might catch a glimmer of a story, right? You caught text messages and you just found out that your partner's been acting out with a woman or a man. 
And then of course that opens the floodgate where you're seeking safety, right? You just found out that your world got turned upside down. What you thought you knew to be your reality is no longer reality. So it's really common for you to need to keep asking more questions to try to find safety, to try to see if this person's going to tell you the truth. Unfortunately, most often that person is really invested in hiding their addiction, hiding their acting out behaviors. So they're not going to tell you the truth. It'll come out maybe in trickling. So it'll come out in a tiny little piece here or there. Um, and then there'll be another piece later on. So we really, I mean, we as an experts in this field encourage not allowing staggered disclosures to happen because you can, as you can imagine, they can be extremely traumatizing, re-rip re open wounds, um, trigger lots of emotional dysregulation because it's so scary and it's so upsetting. So I want to validate that, that we really want disclosures to happen in a contained environment. So hear this, you have the right to know what has happened during your marriage or during your, your relationship. You have the right to ask these questions. We just encourage, there's a, there's a very general structure to it. And maybe if you have questions about it later, Tammy and I can discuss that, but there's a general structure to it to try to keep it as safe as possible, as structured as possible to, to, to mitigate the amount of trauma and the amount of emotional dysregulation and explosiveness. So um, let's see. And then there's the case as if, you know, there's not enough um, emotional kind of manipulation and gaslighting that happens within the marriage. One of the biggest problems is that you're going to go seek out support groups from people um, because your life is turned upside down. And so it's common to go to other people for help, for co-regulation, for safety, because this person you're married to is not safe. And unfortunately, you hear some pretty messed up things. Um, you first and foremost, if you if you do tell them, meaning friends, family that are that are support supportive people, and you tell them what your husband or wife has engaged in or boyfriend or girlfriend or life partner, um, there'll be statements like this. There's a list here that I thought was really right on. It's no big deal. Everyone cheats. Um, it was only one time that probably meant nothing. And so it won't happen again. Um, you know, just pretend it didn't happen or, you know, or gosh, you're really, really upset still. I mean, he, it happened years ago, maybe like you uncovered something that happened a long time ago. Um, and other things like, um, there's just these long lists of things that your partner, the acting out partner might be saying to kind of uh, well, frankly, gaslight you that make it sound like it's not as big of a deal. Why are you acting so crazy? Uh, maybe you need to go get medication while well, you stopped having sex with me, et cetera. We can go on and, you know, you ignored me. You didn't treat me right. Um, you haven't been too busy. You haven't been there for me. Um, and then when you go out to your support groups, there can also be gaslighting. It could be like, well, what do you mean you want to stick with him and try to work it out? This person's a monster. And gaslighting there, because I, I know from experience of working with betrayed partners, they, I mean, obviously they married this person for a reason. There's good times and this horrible thing has happened. There's children involved. There's, there's years or memories. There's, there's love there. And so anyone kind of point blank telling you you're crazy for wanting to stick around and see how this goes it is just also, it's not as, it's, it's as helpful as your partner saying, Hey, get over it. Like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It meant nothing. Um, so please pay attention to that. Um, that's again, why we have betrayed partners groups, because there's only so many people who can hold space for these stories. They're tragic. They're terrible. They're, they're horrendous. And, and you need to seek out other people who can say like, I hear you, I understand and I get it. And I can hold space for your story because mine's pretty awful too. Um, so there's a couple steps. There's five steps that I'd like you to think about doing out the gate um, if you haven't already done so. And the first step is create a non-negotiable boundary or set of boundaries. So if there's a current affair going on, in order for me to stay in this marriage or to stay engaged in this situation, I'm going to have some non-negotiables. Sever ties with the affair partner. 
We need to put new software up um, on the home to prevent and block all pornography use. No more acting out or going to massage parlors. Uh, remove any kind of triggers or people. There might be people that you were acting out with. And so, sorry, you can't hang out with that, that those drinking buddies that you would go out on business trips with, go get wasted and then go act out with. Um, get tested. Obviously, when there's unprotected sex going on, there can be STDs and other um, things going on between that in that exchange. Sometimes the non-negotiable will be if you want me to stay in this relationship, I need you to enter into some kind of recovery program. So again, it's, you know, I've noticed the theme every time you go out and drink with these buddies, you end up in a massage parlor with a prostitute. So you need to not be with those people anymore. You need to not be drinking anymore until we figure out what the situation with that is it alcoholism or is it just, you know, a part of your acting out behavior, but we need to spend some time investigating that and then not doing any of those behaviors, right? That's another thing that specialists in this field do is, is pull apart the patterns that again, you shouldn't even be trained to or understand or know how to figure out. But that's what we kind of understand from the years of, of watching the way that these engagements and these acting out and these compulsivity type um, behaviors happen is they often happen in a patterned type way. And we can help define what sobriety is going to have to look like. You know, it's not just don't do this, do this, don't do this. It's a collective of patterns and putting puzzle pieces together. Um, and then once you have those non-negotiable boundaries, come up with a consequences list. So if I find out that you're watching porn again, if um, you don't go to the meetings that you have committed to go to, if you don't get tested, um, if you don't sever ties, right? And these are really scary things to do. This is gonna rumble with your already extreme shame state, your trauma, fear of rejection, abandonment, which is already gonna exist because this is the most shaming and rejecting and abandoning experience. But that, that is also, um, I have a lot of videos on talking about that. When you're setting these boundaries, you have to rumble with those voices of, you know, what if he says no? What if she says, you know, pound sand? I don't want to do this, or I don't have a problem. You have a problem, things like that. That's really scary. So getting support to set those up is important. Um, next thing is setting emotional boundaries. So setting up things that are going to require you to have emotional and mental health support. So um, don't allow disclosure in the home, you know, only allow disclosure to happen in the setting of a trained therapist. Um, require that your acting out partner engage their sponsor every day um, to make sure that he or she's working on keeping his side of the street clean. Um, get babysitting for you so that you can maybe go to your support groups or you can have some quiet time or you need to go get your exercise. Um, that he or she, the acting out partner, must inform you if the treatment plan for him or her changes or he or she misses meetings or anything like that is going on. Um, that's just something to think about, right? Because it's all about making sure that you can healthily transcend this crisis. Physical and sexual boundaries. As you can imagine, there, there's got to be boundaries set once you've found out that this has happened in your marriage you're going to probably feel very unsafe. And sometimes, not always, sometimes there's this reverse effect where you maybe in the state of your own trauma are, are more sexual or want to try to keep the person in the marriage so you're um, having more sex with him or her. So setting physical and sexual boundaries outright and talking about it explicitly with your partner can help. You might not feel safe to change in front of him or her anymore. You will not usually feel safe to have sex or physical contact with them or who knows, but that, that is something specific to you and what allows you to feel safe. And you really have to sit down and listen to your heart about what do I feel safe with doing? What are my rules of engagement for physical touch, for sexual touch? Where am I with that? Um, 
there's, there's a note in something I was referencing is about talking that sometimes relapse happens a lot in that first year, um, sometimes. And so therefore having unsafe sex with your partner is, is not advised because then you might still be exposing yourself to those kind of diseases. Um, steps four and five, four is, um, boundaries with people, places, and things. Here's some examples that I thought were really great about how to set examples for people, um, places, and things. Um, so it might be that I need you to change your job because most of your acting out partners were involved with your job, or um, there's a lot of acting out on business meetings or business travel. And so maybe I need you to change your way that you engage in that. That's obviously been off the shelf recently a lot because of COVID. Um, there's not that much business travel, but then that means when, when we get back online, you're gonna have to start creating boundaries around that. Um, I want a new pornography filtration software installed in our computers. I sometimes clients, um, we've talked about this before, they put GPS apps on their phones. So there's an agreement that I get to kind of know, I get to know where you are. So I can just look on my phone and, and know where you are. Or I, I know other people who've had open transparency in their text messages where I can read and see all of your text messages, all of your phone calls, because maybe there's a lot of acting out um, affairs going on via text message with other women. Um, you know, uh, let's see. Sometimes it's, I want to move. I want to go to a different city. We need to go to a different church. We need to go to a different area, but these are boundaries on people's places and things that I need again, to feel safe. Uh, this is also going to include as we're entering the holidays, you know, it's November 11th today, we are beginning the holiday season. And if the shit just hit the fan in the past couple months, seven, eight, nine months, you might be seeing people for the first time in many months. And there needs to be an explicit discussion about who you're willing to tell, what you're going to say to them, what the rules of engagement are gonna be, um, what you feel comfortable with doing and seeing and not. Um, and so that needs to be discussed as well. Lastly, uh, and a very important part is building your support network and making a plan for your own self-care. You have got to sit down. And again, I know when we're in this crisis state, thinking, even thinking of calming self-care things just seems so far away. Um, like going to a large concert because that feels so far away these days, right? We can't even wrap our brains around that. But you have, you've got to take the time to think about that. Again, um, getting hugs from safe people makes me feel more safe. Uh, having walking my dog makes me feel safe. Going to a therapist appointment makes me feel safe. Going to these support groups. Um, there's S Anon meetings. So that's like a Al Anon for sex addict partners. Um, going to these betrayed partners groups on sex and relationship healing.com makes me feel safe. Reading articles, listening to podcasts. Um, I actually encourage that. I'm a, I, I'm a really like cognitive person. But this stuff is so confusing, the gaslighting and the manipulation and the denial and the minimization from the acting out partners, at least initially before they get recovery is mind blowing and mind bending. And so I often encourage people to just fill their brain with the truth. Um, you know, I send a lot of Rob Weiss's um, podcast to clients so they can hear these experts talk. And the more they can hear it, the more they can create the framework in their brain for what recovery looks like, what makes sense. And then when their partner comes at them with minimization and what's the big deal? Yeah, I'm not going to any meetings this week. I'm really busy. And you have the framework to explain why you don't feel comfortable with that, why it feels extremely unsafe, why you're furious and raging that they say it so casually and dismissively. And, and you have the presence of mind and the language to be able to be an advocate for yourself in this deeply confusing crisis-filled time. So that's one of my strategies. I, it, sometimes it doesn't work for people, 
but it's like, it's a double whammy in my mind, go for that long walk. That's healthy for you and throw in some podcasts of something, you know, another expert from Rob Weiss. So you get that language for you at the same time. And sometimes you don't want to do that. Sometimes you want to break from it. Sometimes you want to hang out with girlfriends and pretend like your life hasn't been turned upside down for just two and a half seconds. Um, so those are generally the things that I um, think are the most immediate needs for that. And I see we already have lots of questions. So let's get on yeah. that. But the first question, Kristen, is how do we handle disclosure when we are separated and in different states for a couple of months? And with COVID, do we wait until we are back together or go forward with everyone on Zoom? Um, disclosure is always dependent on lots of things, right? It depends on what the plan is. Are you going to, is there a plan for reconciliation? And, and because often disclosure is meant to be a uh, multi, multi purpose One of it is because the acting out partner has usually kind of wrapped him or herself in a blanket of denial and minimization. And so actually creating a timeline of how many times they acted out and how, mu how many boundaries they crossed that they really didn't think that they crossed and that it wasn't that bad. Writing it all out is kind of hard to, to, to deny its existence when you have it written all out. So that's one of the purposes. And then the second is when you do the disclosure with your partner, it's this idea that um, a common shame voice in an in a acting out partner is if any of these people ever really knew me, um, they wouldn't love me. This is all fake you know, so yeah, I have a wife or a husband or a family, but they don't know this dark cavernous black hole that I, of this world that I live in, these lies that I tell, this huge house of cards that I've built and they don't know. And if they really knew me, they wouldn't love me. And so the idea is that if you're planning on reconciling with a partner, you, you have to have a disclosure to get, get that out, to shake out all the moths in the closet and then move forward. And then for the betrayed partner, it's an opportunity to say, okay, this is it. You know, hopefully it will help my neurobiology. I mean, it's shocking and earth shattering. I'm not going to minimize that. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult experience, but at, the, at least at that point, then you'll feel like, okay, so we can start from scratch. And by the way, it doesn't go gracefully like that. Like I have no words to properly demonstrate the chaos that occurs during the disclosure um, and the feelings involved in it. But those who decide to hear it, and many times I've watched you know, them hear it, and the feelings later is a bit of a relief because it's like, I always knew stuff didn't make sense for years, it just didn't. And now at least I know, like this, this was it, this was happening. Um, and then you have to kind of decide um, how you're going to basically be moving forward from there. So anyway, handling disclosure when you're separated in different states. Well, again, thanks to COVID, we're actually really good at doing these kind of things remotely. Um, I work sometimes with a husband-wife combo that will do these remotely. So um, the husband will sit down and work with disclosure, building the timeline. The wife will um, support the betrayed partner, they'll create structure and plans. You know, is it gonna be done remotely? Will you be doing it in the same space? And then there's a, a polygraph afterward. That's how that particular couple structures their disclosure process. It's gonna be different for different people. Um, and then, and so about waiting till you get back together or go forward is you have to ask yourself that. What feels safe for you? If you feel like you need to work on it and move forward with it now and you can't move forward without it, then you might need to be working on it now via Zoom and, and get it done. And not every partner wants disclosure, honestly. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. no, I, I mean, some of them go, you know, it's bad. I know it, you know, I know enough. You know, I don't need, you know, more details. Some of them, it's bad, I'm leaving. You know, I, everybody gets to pick. And I think that that's why it's an ongoing discussion for clinicians of like, you know, how do we do this, you know, uh, so that we are best able to support our clients. So, mm -hmm. so that's a very, yeah, that's a very open general answer to your question. And hopefully there's some nuggets in there that are useful. So next question. And this was interesting because you were talking about that 
with um, uh, sexual boundaries, but boundaries make sense that no longer allowing sexual acting out with limitations such as strip clubs, social media sites, affairs, et cetera. But what type of boundary is acceptable for sex and intimacy? It seems there is no clear answer to this. What is okay to do in the bedroom for healthy, fun sex or not to do? And what I don't know is if this is the betrayer or the betrayed asking this. I have a suspicion, but not sure. Okay. Well, the reason why there's no clear cut answer to this is because I can never define for you what feels safe to you in sexually and intimately. Um, so for me, let's say I was giving an example of hugs from safe people feel safe to me. Um, I, I have to determine who the safe people are, you know, after betrayed, it might be like my children and like a mom or like a close friend or from my dog or something like that. It might not be other types of people, or it might not be any kind of hugging or touching whatsoever because hugging might be too much for me. It might trigger my sympathetic, you know, highly agitated response. Uh, so that has to be the question. Um, and I think a really important, so that's the first one is, is really sitting down um, and thinking about what feels healthy and safe to you. And then I think the second part is that you have to check your heart and your motivation about, is this for me or is this for my acting out partner, right? Because I will say it is some, sometimes, not always, common for you to not feel safe enough to say, okay, so I just found out that my partner's been cheating on me for years, having sex with a bunch of other people. They've told me that I'm unattractive, that I stopped having sex with them after kids, and that I'm really boring in bed and all these really hurtful things. And so the last thing you feel safe to do to hold on to your marriage is to be like, well, now I really don't want to have sex with you because I just found out that you're a monster. So your body may be telling you this man's a or woman is a monster and I don't want to have sex with them because you have to usually feel safe to want intimacy with someone, to feel okay with them. Um, but there's a part of you that out of shame or fear or rejection or abandonment, you'll, you'll want to engage in those behaviors. So it's really important that you do the work, hopefully with a professional, to figure out if I'm doing this for, I guess, manipulative reasons or a truly because the sexual experience, I can kind of separate it out and I still, this is a healing experience for me. It feels good, I like it and it's, it's done safely. Next question. My husband is sober, but not in full recovery. We are in a uh, couples therapy. This has been going on for 16 months and I still feel hurt and sad. He has been told he needs to go to individual therapy, but he attends meetings, no sponsor. We've been married for a long time, almost 50 years. Our insurance does not cover a therapist that is trained in sex addiction. We do not have any funds to afford the help. He has been acting out with cyber sex, chat rooms, and porn. He has a six-year emotional affair with a lot of uh, sick S&M fantasies and other sexual talk, gifts, exchange, et cetera. All the acting out, as far as I know, covered a total of 13 years. How do I help myself feel happy in my marriage? I do self-care and attend all the support groups. Um, this is a hard road and I mm -hmm. agree with that. I do the work, but I feel he does not. I have been told he, uh, he has to do the work. <sighs> I know, I, I hear that story often and I'm sorry. Uh, that trapped and sad and hurtful um, feeling is a tangible one for a lot of people in that situation. Uh, as far as finances and getting help goes, and again, especially during this COVID era, all 12-step meetings are at the fingertips of everybody, right? 12-step meetings are free. There is um, Sex and Porn Addiction Addicts Anonymous. There's Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. There's um, every kind of narcotic, drug, alcohol Addicts Anonymous programs. Uh, Los Angeles, the area where I live, is kind of famous for having really great recovery. You could even be watching Los Angeles AA meetings from the comfort of your own home. Um, I know too, what I love is like sex and relationship healing.com's created these workshops where they can, it is not therapy and it is not to replace therapy, but it is a really beautiful complement to therapy and to the work that you do in 12 steps, which is those 12 step men's 
um, workbook groups that you guys have going on, right? To yeah. really dive in to understand, because I hope everyone is understanding and, and Scott and I, another content provider of sex and relationship healing.com are trying to get everyone to see is that 12 steps isn't just these 12 steps. It's this concept. It's this community. It's these life-changing ways of looking at life and engaging life um, that are so much more than just the words 12 steps. And so, you know, we've been writing a book to try to explain this to people who might not otherwise um, engage in it and want to understand it because there's stigma around addiction sometimes. So what I'm trying to say is that finances are an issue there there's there's meetings and then you're saying uh she's saying that um you know he's not doing the work i feel like i am it is really hard for you to heal your trauma if you are continuing to be exposed to the trauma and so you know we're talking about non-negotiable boundaries and and being so bold as to creating some consequences to them I can't tell, the, tell you what those non-negotiable boundaries are going to be. I can't tell you what those consequences should be for you. You have to determine those. Um, but what I, I am hearing from your words are, I don't feel safe. I'm not feeling safe. And it's because my partner is continuing to not choose to be in recovery and do a full uh, kind of leaning in and, and humbling and surrendering himself to a full recovery program you know, can my neurobiology, can my state of being handle this constant state of threat that you're feeling all the time? But I want to key in on how do I feel happy in my marriage? And I'm going, I, I want you to find happiness for you. And then there's your marriage. So, so I really do. I know lots of partners who've been able to find support and happiness, regardless of what their loved one is doing. It takes time. It takes work. But you know, the, the chaos that he's in does not have to, you know, completely upend your, your okayness. You know, it's, it is something to keep, you know, it's a challenge and I'm not saying it's easy, but, but you can get there, um, in, um, in knowing you're, you're here, you're getting support. Um, so, so you are not just your marriage, you know, it's a factor but you can find, you know, happiness. And the word I like is joy because happiness always feels like it's right. bleeding on whatever's going on. And, you know, I like, oh, that makes me happy. Contentment is a great one too. Yeah. Contentment or joy are things that, you know, I can have regardless of the circumstances happening around me. So, you know, that's a more internal thing for me, but I love contentment. That's great. Okay. So next question. I am new to this betrayal. I'm so glad you're here. I am so sorry. Like Kristen was sharing earlier, I, you know, I was like, yeah, no one gets a manual for, it. and then in, in when this point in your relationship, you're going to have to deal with this, you know, like you were sharing about your mom and the pancreatic cancer. No one, no one knows how to deal with this stuff. So I have been working on myself in the betrayal process. I feel the essay partner isn't working his program or taking it seriously. Any recommendations for me? Should I just be focusing on myself? Right. Well, at this time, I mean, yeah, that's the difficult thing. It's, it's trying to say you, you're only one member of a relationship, right? And so you can't control that other person. And sometimes you can be doing the definition of insanity, trying to c control another person's sickness or struggle or choices. Um, so it's maddening to say this because I understand how maddening it feels, but yeah, you, you can only focus on yourself. You can only run your own program for healing and for recovery and for a better understanding and footing for what's happened, right? That's, that's how trauma is, is healed. Trauma is this like debris that floats in, in your body and your brain because it doesn't know where to file away. Um, you know, I use the example that like September 11th, the day the terrorist attacks are so confusing because planes aren't supposed to fly into buildings. Other countries aren't supposed to suddenly kill thousands of people without ever, but like without warning and being so blindsided and having no language for it, right? Uh, trauma gets transcended 
when we educate ourselves, contextualize and better understand what happened, how it happened, how to make myself safe in order for it to be prevented in the future, potentially, um, how to create safeguards and structure to keep myself safe, right? Those are the ways that we find ourselves being able to transcend through traumatic um, crisis events. And so despite what your partner chooses to do, you have to continue that journey, right? Because no matter what the, the trauma has happened, the crisis has occurred, and that is the only way you're gonna get through it. You don't know if your partner's gonna ever choose to get out of the madness and the insanity cycle, but you can. One, one story that I like about de delineating is, um, and again, this, this man wasn't a sex addict, but he's the one telling the story. And he said, you know, he would probably define himself as a rage addict. He was very rageful, passive aggressive. Um, and so his wife kind of seeing the writing on the wall that he wasn't willing to get help, she started doing her own work. And so she started kind of working on herself, uh, have building her own life building her own healing process. She was very religious. So also kind of forming connection with her higher power to kind of surrender what she doesn't have control of. And of course, as he feels her kind of pull away to do her own healing process, he starts an affair with somebody. And so he walks in one day to her room and says, you know, you've not been a very good wife to me. You um, haven't been giving me enough love and attention. Um, so I've started this affair with, with this woman and I'm going to be leaving you for her now. And her part of the story is that she'd done so much kind of work that she'd come to this level of acceptance that this marriage may work out or it may not, but no matter what, like I need to learn how to stay afloat despite the chaos going on. And she said, you know, it, it sounds like you have a problem, but it is not me. And so mm. you go do yeah. whatever you need to do but I'm pretty sure that no one will ever love you the way that I've loved you. Wow. And he's the one telling the story. And his, and his response to that was first and foremost, freedom. Like, cause his whole life, he worked out a duty and obligation and always felt the smothering of, I have to do this stuff. This is what's required of me. And he did it always so resentfully and ragefully, right? And so first it's like, well, what do you mean? Like, I'm not responsible for you. I'm not like supposed to go fix something. And she's like, no, do, go do your bad self, whatever you want to do. Um, but then the second was like, holy crap, she's right. Um, and it was a pivotal moment in their marriage that shifted. Uh, and it doesn't always happen so Disneyland beautifully, right? But I thought that that was a really great story to demonstrate um, how sometimes you working on yourself can really shift the system. It's not done gracefully and it's not done without chaos and hurt. So know that, but it can shift it later and eventually to a better place. And there's support. I mean, you know, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately you're not alone, but you know, so, so please lean in the podcasts um, uh, that uh, the sex love and addiction podcast or the overcoming betrayal and addiction podcast. All of them are on sex and relationship healing.com. Kristen has done some on um, uh, with Dr. Rob on there as well. Um, and um, I did put a link for the lecture uh, work group series. Um, so the next question, Kristen, you can answer or not answer. Um, are you both also betrayed spouses? And the big guy that walked through never, never has betrayed me. I have had profound betrayal, uh, right. previous relationship, uh, including a few years ago with a situation and I'll leave it more oblique, but 10 months, 10 months of nightmares. And I'll tell you what, it really gave me a whole lot more empathy for partners. So even though it was is so incredibly painful. Um, oh, I'm crying. Um, I, I will take it because, um, because I have far more understanding for the pain of the spouses, um, the, but, but, but not even spouses, partners, and that anyone who's gone through betrayal has uh, experienced. Um, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm in recovery from addiction, multiple multiple winners, you know, and so, so I always had that lens and, you know, um, could be empathetic with, with addicts that want to, um, to heal, um, and understand, you know, that it isn't just easy. Well, I'm going to quit. 
but um, but unfortunately, uh, a very painful personal experience, um, you know, has led me to have far more deeper, real right. uh, emotional understanding for what partners go through. So, right, and and similar to what Tammy's saying, I have also experienced profound what my reality was is profound betrayal. Um, but by the way that we def define betrayed partners in sex and relationship healing.com, they're often betrayed partners whose par partners would be diagnosed or fill the brackets for sexually acting out, um, sex addicts. I, that is not, um, I, I am not a betrayed partner in that respect. Um, but again, I have several years of experience working not just with the addicts, um, but with betrayed partners as well, um, and with a lot of trauma as well. So I've become a huge advocate um, for betrayed partners, um, and, and I can feel deep compassion and understanding for, for both sides, actually. Um, never an excuse, but just understanding and compassion for what goes on on both sides, so... I always, I mentioned I'm subbing in and every time I'm on one of the partner groups, I always feel for the next addict that calls me because they're, you know, probably going to get the ear full of, do you know, you know, right. I mean, if, if they had a measure of understanding um, and I think they do, I, you know, I really do think addicts on some level do, but it's so painful to have to look at and shaming and all of that. So, but if they could just, you know, hold the space for just a few minutes and really understand, you know, that they can change and that it can be different for them and their loved one you know everybody would be you know running to get you know to get the right help we are out of time thank you all for joining us today thank you Kristen as always great uh, great webinar great information shared and very practical tools and for those of you if you are a betrayed partner and would like to consider her uh, group it's an online group kristensnowden.com k-r-i-s-t-i-n-s-n-o-w-d-e-n.com and um, uh, of course always sexandrelationshiphealing.com and seekingintegrity.com has that work group for those of you that can't see the chat seekingintegrity.com has the work groups there's a, a number of different offerings so so I'll see you in December Kristen Yes, thank you. I will see you in December because right. this all Take continues. Care. Yes, exactly. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.